Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 10th, 2018. And first up here from MIT, or from actually from the website Engadget, MIT embarks on ambitious plan to build nuclear fusion plant by 2033. It just received a $50 million worth of funding to do um, so. And I have followed it. We've got the German one. We've got other various um, ways that people are different people in different groups are trying to produce nuclear fusion, uh, which, by the way, is quite a bit different than the nuclear plants we have operating right now, which uses nuclear fission as far as the uh, radioactive breakdown of materials to produce. See, basically, they're just pr ways of producing heat to run steam uh, turbines. And fusion's a little bit different. It actually binds particles together, kind of like what's going on in the sun to produce so much energy. And it's a uh, perpetual motion machine in a way, or at least as close as we have in this universe in physics to a perpetual motion machine, because it actually reaches a point where it can produce more energy than it actually uses because it's a nuclear process. So um, normal physics don't have to apply like they do to uh, larger mechanical devices. And no, there are, as far as I know, nobody still has yet to uh, invent a... Uh, perpetual motion machine. But anyway, getting back to this article here, um, one of the breakthroughs they have, which I'm really impressed with, is the type of uh, magnetic fields they're going to use to confine it. What's uh, been happening in the past is because this stuff is so unstable, you have to con confine it into like a floating donut because it can't touch anything. This hot plasma is so hot that any type of vessel that you could possibly design just cannot contain it. So it has to actually float in a vacuum and not be touching anything, and you have to hold it in place with these really strong magnets. So where MIT has come up with something to get this $50 million grants is, uh, I'll read a little bit of the article here, the extremely high temperatures require that magnetic fields rather than solid materials can find the hot plasma in which the fusion reaction takes place. MIT and CFS plan to use newly available superconducting materials to develop large electromagnets that can produce fields four times stronger than any being used now. Now that's quite a factor. I would be impressed even if it was double, but if they can actually engineer it and produce fields that are four times stronger, um, we're getting fairly close to the break-even point right now. I mean, a lot of the reactions have gone way over 50%, I think some even 80%, as I remember. And uh, further on it goes, the stronger magnetic fields will allow far more power for more power to be generated, resulting in, importantly, positive net energy. This method will hopefully allow for cheaper and smaller reactors. The research team aims to develop a prototype reactor within the next 10 years, followed by a 200-megawatt pilot power plant. If MIT can do what they're saying, and I have no reason to think they can't, this is from the author, this is a major step forward. Stephen Dean, head of Maryland-based advocacy group Fusion Power Associates, told Nature. So... Very impressive. I think also just some of the side benefits of this, too. There may be uh, offshoots worth just as much as the fusion reactor if they can develop these uh, super magnets to be able to use in other things, especially motors. If we can just up efficiency in motors um, along with solar panels as far as uh, energy use, that's one thing. That, to be able to use any kind of motorized product or heating element product on a uh, solar system, it's just still not practical to do it to any extent, but if they can make motors even maybe 25% more efficient and keep them within the same reasonable cost factor, that could do a lot really to help with alternate energy and just using less energy in the first place. So this next article is from WWLTV.com and from my friend John B. Thank you for sending me the link to this. New blood test could detect cancer before symptoms show. Scientists at Stage 1 Diagnostics in Little Rock, Arkansas, have developed an inexpensive test that looks for high blood levels of a protein called hepcin, already shown to be high in prostate cancer tumors. Not only is this test going to allow people early detection, but it will also allow them a better insight into the makeup of the tumor and potential for the tumor to become a metastic, which is the most lethal form of cancer. That pretty much means it's going to likely spread around your body. We've seen it work in lots of tumor types, but prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, breast, ovarian, those are the main ones we have been looked that have been looked at. Dr. Brent Skaggs, a pathologist at Baptist Health, the head of genetics and precision me medicine at LSU Health, says the test is promising, but he wants to see firm guidelines for doctors to follow with diagnosing patients. Yeah, as usual, too, you don't want to make this some kind of a home test or something like that, because until they perfect it to make it a way, way better test, um, you're going to have a lot of false positives and probably quite a few false negatives, too. And so uh, you might just, because you get a, a positive on the test for cancer, you may test a couple of times again and then be negative for it. So there's always that possibility, too. So they're going to 
keep this in the hands of the doctors and uh, use it between doctors and patients. So, And next, and, and the last one I'm going to do for this week, and a big thank you to Vince A. for this one. This is from sciencemag.org. Let me scroll to the top here. Self-domesticating mice suggest some animals tame themselves without human intervention. Now this is a little bit misleading here. I think even their their theory is a little bit more um, broad than that than I would really call it to. What uh, happened here was they had some mice in a, uh, a protected situation. They had a barn in Switzerland where these mice were allowed to come and go, uh, but the barn was set up to where um, only the mice could enter and leave this barn. They, none of their predators or anything that could chase them or bother them or anything like that could possibly get into the barn. And the uh, humans would bring them plenty of food and water so they would be exposed to human beings. Now, not, obviously not all the mice like that deal so much being exposed to human beings because mice are very shy and timid type of creatures. So, But of the mice that did stick around and went in and out pretty soon, they lost their fear of human beings completely. And when the researchers would come in to uh, put the food and water down as they could come and go as they pleased, uh, the uh, mice would actually run over the researchers' shoes instead of scurrying away. And so to them that was a sign these had lost these mice had lost their fear of humans even with the researchers not breeding uh, the most human friendly mice. So basically that's what they were saying was the researchers were making no effort to try to breed certain mice together for domestic type of traits. They were letting the mice freely breed as they chose, but it always tends to be in that kind of a situation that the mice that did not stick around the human beings and sp stick around the protected environment probably faced a lot more dangers and didn't last that long, whereas the ones that would spend more time in the protected environment with also a supply of food and water were exposed to human beings all the time, and they probably lived a longer, healthier life, too, because they had the things provided for them. So um, just that type of selection. But to say it was no human intervention, that's probably kind of pushing it a little bit. So uh, they've been doing these studies for a lot of years, and it says four years later, Anna Lind Home, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, began to notice white patches of fur on a few of the russet-colored mice. It was very rare, she says, and some mice the white patches make up as few as eight hairs. From 2010 to 2016, the proportion of adult mice with white fur patches more than doubled. That's one of the signs. Two things you find in domesticated animals when they do start um, either domesticating themselves or humans are domesticating them is you get these white patches. They did it in a study in Russia with the foxes that they began to get white patches. Some animals get curly tails too. Beside, and then their head size tends to shrink too towards uh, uh, body size. And they measured these mice too. They were doing another study at the same time. And uh, they said their heads shrank at about 3.5% on average in these mice that became more tame. So that's kind of an interesting study too. Yeah, I think basically uh, what they're saying here is whether the, my, the mice or fox or any other animal had been deliberately tamed or not, just the fact that they were exposed to human presence and the humans provided them some type of protection or extra food supply or anything like that. And it's going to kind of eventually take place anyway, either in a slower way or a faster way than uh, breeding them purposefully for tameness. So. Anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week. Oh, and say hi to my little friend Thumbelina here who joins me for most of my TDD reports. Take care. I'll catch you next week.